Well, today we are in week three of our series called What's Next, and uh, we have been talking about what God has for you and that every one of us has a step in our spiritual journey. Uh, our theme verse is, comes out of Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. This is the message. The message is not a translation. This is a paraphrase. I rarely ever teach out of the message. So if you came in here with a Bible and you're like, this is not a real church, if they're teaching out of the message, paraphrase, just want to tell you, um, we don't normally teach out of this translation or this paraphrase, but here's what it says. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Some of you, you're walking into church today and you feel like you're stumbling. We stumble when we don't know where we're going. Okay, I have a two-year-old daughter. Her name's Junie. Last year uh, on my time hop, I saw a video of her, okay? And she was just learning how to walk and she wasn't very good at it, okay? And she wasn't very good at it and she tried to take it to the next level when it came to her walking. So she took her shirt and put it over her face and started walking around the house, And I'm just thinking to myself, there is no way this is going to end well. Like you can barely walk when you can see, nonetheless, when you can't see. Inevitably, about seven seconds later, and maybe I'm a terrible father for letting her continue to do this, she ends up walking into the couch and falling straight down and crying. I pick her up, I console her, but in that moment, I thought it was such a great representation of what we do with our life when we don't follow God. When we do it our own way. Some of you, you're walking into church this morning and the reason you're stumbling is because you're not doing it God's way. If you're walking in here thinking that or or maybe today you think that your problem is the mess that you have or your certain financial situation or any of those things, part of those issues are problems, but the mess ultimately is not having the right focus. It's not having the right clarity. It's not having the right vision for what God wants to do in your life. But this verse says, when we attend to what he reveals, we are most blessed. When you see what God has for you, you can start experiencing the blessing that God has for you. And really, this blessing is a deep contentment. That's what it is. It's a void in your life that is full. You feel filled, okay? It's like after a Thanksgiving dinner, you just feel full. That's the type of life that God wants to create in you. All throughout Scripture, we see that there is a path of life. The second verse that we've been walking through is Psalm 16, 11, where it says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Notice what this doesn't say. It doesn't say, you will show me the way of life and God, you will give me material blessings for my life. God can give you blessing, but ultimately we see in this verse, what is our goal? It is the joy of his presence and it is the pleasure of living with him forever. That we aren't just a church or a people that says, I want more from God. I want more God. I want more of God. That's who I want. I want God's presence in my life. When you experience it, you experience his joy. His joy is not circumstantial. You get to experience the pleasure of God no matter what you're facing today. This spiritual journey um, is four principles that we've been talking through. The first step in our spiritual journey, if you haven't written these down, you can write these down, is this. It's to help people. Our goal is to help people know God. Okay, Not just know about God but to actually know him. It's not about religion. It is about having a personal relationship with him. And you can't do the next part of the spiritual journey until you take that first step in knowing God. The second step is to find freedom. This is the one we're gonna be talking about today. I'm so excited about it. Once you have God's power inside of you through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will begin growing in our relationship with him and we will start shedding off the things that have been holding us back from what God has for us in our life. It's about getting over uh, the struggles that we're having, not that we won't have struggles, but that we can find freedom in the midst of them. It's ultimately the thing in your life That if it wasn't there anymore, your life would be better. That's what it looks like to be able to find freedom. It's that habit, that secret sin, that shame, the constant uh, looking in the rearview mirror. You can't see the future until you've settled your past. After you do that, you can discover your purpose. We talked about this last week. In simplest form, you were born on purpose for a purpose. You are not an accident, even if your mama told you you are, okay? 
God loves you. He's with you. He's for you. Uh, Our purpose is discovered when we start learning more about how we are wired and what God has for us in our life. And then the last one is we will be able to make a difference. So we've kind of reverse engineered this. We've begun with the end in mind. So three weeks ago or a couple weeks ago, we talked about make a difference. Last week, we talked about discovering purpose. Today, we're talking about finding freedom. All throughout scripture, what you see in order for people to find freedom, it happens through God's incredible grace and also how God works through relationship, which is interesting to me because most of the pain that you've experienced and what a lot of you are walking in today, the reason you have that pain is because of a relationship. So what's interesting about God is God uses relationships to heal, but also relationships can break us. You see, in James, it says, confess your sins to God and you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to others and you will be healed. That's why as a church, we're passionate about groups and getting you connected with each other because we know that if you get connected with each other, man, you're going to get further faster and you're going to be able to experience the life that God has for you. The title of today's message is this, the blood has power. Oh, come on. There we go. I like that. Now, some of you, when you walked in, you noticed there's a blood drive, okay? Okay. That is a complete coincidence, okay? <laughs> we did not plan that. In fact, that is the school. If you, want to, if you want to give blood after that, feel free. That's not from us. The school does that every, at the end of every April, um, and they're planted out there. But I thought that was funny. I didn't even think about it until I was reading this. I was like, oh, well, we didn't plan that, but maybe we would just say we did, okay? <laughs> All right. So we're laughing, having fun. I just want to give a caveat to the next 21 minutes. Today's going to be intense. What God has spoken and what we're going to be talking about is an intense subject, specifically when it comes to freedom. And I just want to get you mentally prepared for what God wants to do today, specifically when it comes to this topic. And I truly believe that God wants to do some incredible things in your heart. And if you are open to receiving that, I believe he will do that. So I encourage you to be open. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 says this, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Most people in our culture do not understand the power of the cross. It is something they've heard about. They may even come to church on Christmas and Easter. They may even believe there is a God, but the cross to them is more about a a fashion statement than actual power that God provided through the cross. It's more a part of their fit than actual functionality of what God wants to do in them and through them. But to the people of God, the cross represents the power of God. The cross has power and Jesus' blood has power. Jesus didn't just go to the cross to go to the cross. Jesus did it as an intentional act for us. And today I want to talk about the freedom that the cross and the blood provides. Revelation chapter 12 says this, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. What's come at last? Salvation. That today, even though we were created and we fell short of God's glorious standard, God sent Jesus for us, that if we place our faith in him, we can be saved and experience eternity in heaven. That is absolutely incredible. Can we just take a moment to thank God that he sent Jesus for us? Come on. (laughs) Caveat. Most people in this room and most Christians experience salvation, but they miss out on these other two pieces. They miss out on the power and the authority that God gives them through Christ. Some of you have salvation. Today, I want to encourage you to be reminded of the power and the authority you have been given through Christ. Now, why don't you have that? Or why aren't you reminded? It's because there's an enemy. The verse continues. It says, For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Who is the accuser? It's not your mother-in-law. It's not your boss. It's not your landlord. Some of you are like, you haven't met my boss, Josh. That's not the enemy. The enemy is the devil, and his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. And I don't know if you've noticed he's been doing a really good job in our culture lately. 
But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life to the full. He didn't say, I just came to give you eternal life. He said, I want to give you full life now. And one of my sadnesses of being a preacher and a pastor and seeing people is they have eternal life, but they don't have life to the full now. And the reason many of you do not have life to the full right now is because you haven't found freedom from the things that are holding you back. And God wants to do that to you this morning. How do we experience this freedom? It says, and they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. The blood has power. So let's dive into it, okay? Let's go. All right, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. I want to take us back to Holy Week, the week leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. On Thursday, Jesus and his disciples um, had Passover. And uh, Passover is now where we really get communion, which we're going to be receiving at the end of tonight. And uh, after they, you know, had their some burrows for dinner or whatever they were eating, they go out and Jesus washes the disciples' feet which would not have been a flattering job at all. Judas slips away, betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which this is just a quick side shows us that greed will take you places that you'd never want to go. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays to his father and says, Father, he basically says, can you take this cup from me? But not my will, your will be done which I think this shows us something. Again, this is not the point of the talk, but just to help some of you. Some of you, you know you're about to walk into a difficult season, walk into a different difficult conversation, a difficult meeting. What is the most important thing you can do? What did Jesus do when he was about to um, embark on the most difficult thing he was ever going to face? He got on his hands and knees and he prayed to his father and God gave him the strength he needed in that moment. So when you know you're about to head into a difficult season, get on your knees and pray. After he's done praying, the Romans come pick him up, and all night long, Jesus is going through six trials. Hopefully, you'll be able to learn some things this morning, but through these six trials, um, here's something interesting, is that these trials, that these trials would have actually been illegal in Jewish and Roman law because you couldn't try someone at night. The reason they were trying Jesus at night is because they didn't want anybody to know about it. These six trials, um, he had his first meeting or trial with Annas, and then he had it with Caiaphas, then he had it with the Sanhedrin, then he had it with Pilate, then he had it with Herod, and then he went back to Pilate from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. So Jesus is going through all of these trials, and in Matthew chapter 26, it says this, Inside, the leading priests and the entire council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. Why were they trying to find people? Because they didn't have anything they could accuse Jesus of. He's completely perfect. He'd only ever loved people. He'd only ever healed people. So they had to search for people to ask about Jesus and figure out what they were going to do because there was no fact to their claims. How can you convict a perfect man? Then someone has an idea. They're like, wait a minute. We can convict him for something. So this is what they asked him. They said, then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said, you have said it. Then they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. Jesus is the the person, he is the one who has the ability to break the yoke of bondage in our life. What I love about Jesus and what he says, he says, I am the son of God. When Jesus says this, it changes everything. Some of you, you're walking into church today and you're maybe not sure about this Jesus thing, or maybe you say you believe in Jesus, but here's my question for you. When Jesus states that he is the son of God, there are three different options when it comes to the person of Jesus, and there's no in between. Jesus is either a liar, he's either a lunatic and crazy for claiming to be the son of God, or he is the Lord of your life. Those are your three options. So the question is, which one do you think he is? Deeper question, which one do your actions reveal he is? Do you fall down and worship him? Or is Jesus just another person? And if you're walking around saying Jesus was just a good prophet or a good man, no, you cannot say that. He was not just a good prophet or a good man. He had to have been a liar. He's either the son of God and deserves your whole life, or you shouldn't be at church this morning. 
After they spit in his face, they send him off to the most excruciating pain you could ever go through, which was a crucifixion. The Romans specialized in crucifixions. Like, they they specialized in how can we make this the most painful experience anybody could ever walk through. I heard a pastor say this. He said, Jesus could have paid for our sins at any moment in human history. Why did he pick that time frame? I'd never thought about it that way before. And he said, you know, if Jesus was put to death in the United States, I'm not trying to put it lightly, but he would have had it easy. I mean, he would have had a lethal injection. And that would have been a walk in the park compared to a Roman crucifixion. And he asked this question, and I I can't stop thinking about it. What if Jesus picked that moment because he knew it would be the most excruciating pain and it would show how much he loved us? That Jesus picked the most difficult, painful, excruciating pain to show you how much you matter to him. What's amazing about this story is that there is a prophet named Isaiah who talked about what was going to happen to Jesus 800 years before Jesus died. If you're skeptical of God today and you're asking questions, I just want you to take a moment to think about that. The manuscripts of scripture that we read talks about, Isaiah talks about what Jesus was going to do 800 years before it ever happened. That's insane. And ultimately, Isaiah saw in exact detail what was going to happen. And he mentions four different things, four different areas, four wounds of the crucifixion this morning uh, that I want to walk through that I believe is going to help you experience freedom. Here's what Isaiah said in chapter 53, verse 5. He said, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. These didn't just happen to Jesus. These happened for you. Most Christians, they're going to go to heaven someday, but you can have this today. You can have freedom this morning, and I want to show you how. Let's walk through these four areas that Isaiah talks about, but I want to do them in chronological order of how they would have happened to Jesus. This is where it's going to get a little intense. The first step of a crucifixion was scourging. Okay, so what the Romans would do is they had a cat of nine tails, which was a handle about a foot long. They had nine leather strands attached um, to this foot long handle. They would tie horsehair along with bone, glass, rock, and wire on this cat of nine tails. Now, if you've ever seen a movie of Jesus um, getting whipped, essentially people would go like this and they would see that. But it's much more than that. What they would do is they would take this cattail and they would place it in water so it would get so heavy that they would have to hold it with two hands and they would lash it into Jesus. They would get the stuff in his skin. They would pull down and then pull up. And that's what they would do. They did that 39 times. They couldn't do it more than that because Roman law said you can't do it more than 39 times. They would do 13 across the right shoulder 13 across the left shoulder, and 13 across the spine. Many people never actually made it to the cross because they died of the scourging. So the question we have to ask is why did Jesus go through that and what does that represent in our life? Here's your first point if you're taking notes. The whip represents freedom in my body. By his stripes, we are healed. Every time Jesus was whipped, that represents a disease, an infirmity, something that you would bear in your body that you don't have to bear because Jesus bared it for you. Jesus said, I will pay the price for your sin, but I also will pray, uh, pay the price for your sickness as well. Jesus took the stripes on his back so you didn't have to. And you can experience healing this morning. Some of you are saying, do you still believe that Jesus heals people? Yes! Jesus is the great physician. He hasn't retired. He's not done. He's not retired sitting on a lake with a beer. He still has the ability to heal this morning. So why doesn't he heal everyone? I have absolutely no idea. But I know that Jesus 
can heal. I know that Jesus heals people on earth, and if you don't get healed on earth, you're going to one day get healed in heaven. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I believe that some of you have walked through the doors today and you need healing. And we are going to pray at the end of this service for you specifically to experience the healing that only Jesus can provide. Jesus paid a high price so that you could be healed. And I truly believe that Jesus can heal you. After this, they did something in the midst of the crucifixion that they normally wouldn't do. They took Jesus to the praetorium. This is ultimately where the Roman guards would hang out. This is essentially their locker room, okay? And uh, there, they begin to mock him. They say he's the king of the Jews, which they were not happy about because they believed that they were the king of Jews. They put a purple robe on him. In scripture, purple represents royalty. They blindfolded him, slapped him, and said, if you're a prophet... Who hit you? Now, how many of you know Jesus could have said, who hit him? And he could have turned them into a pillar of assault in second if he wanted to. But Jesus did not do that. Why? It's because he went to the, sl- he went to, uh, it says he was like a lamb that went to the slaughter. That Jesus was quiet. He knew that he had to take upon this pain for us. While this is happening, there was a guy on the side who wove a branch into a crown and he shoved that onto Jesus' head. Not only would this have caused blood down Jesus' face, it would have reversed some of the blood to go towards his brain, which would have caused intense pressure. Isaiah saw this, and this is why he said, this punishment brought us peace. So think about this. They put a crown of thorns on his head that's going to cause intense mental pressure. Where do we experience pressure? We experience pressure and stress and anxiety and worry in our brains, right? So what does this thorn represent? The thorns represent freedom in my mind. The punishment that brought us peace. So every time you see those thorns, every time you see that crown on Jesus' head, be reminded that God wants to give you peace of mind today. I'm speaking to someone who's struggling with stress, depression, fear, worry, or anxiety. Your brain is driving you crazy. You don't have peace. Jesus didn't just bring salvation for us so that we can experience it in heaven. Jesus wants to give you his peace this morning. John chapter 14, verse 27 says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. What does the world give? Stress, worry, anxiety, fear. Jesus gives us peace. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. It's not the world's. It's God's peace. So if you're feeling stress, if you're feeling worry, if you're feeling anxiety, you are missing out on the promise that God has for you today. He wants to give you peace. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose what? Minds are steadfast because they trust in you. I want you to have peace. So every time you see that crown, Remind yourself that Jesus experienced pain in his head so you wouldn't have to go through pain in your own head. In today's society, I think it's so important. And I just want you to know, like as a church, we're, we're not against medicine, we're not against counseling, we're not against therapy. Those are all great things that I believe that God created and we can use. But I also just want you to know for some of you, your stress, your anxiety, your worry, God has the ability to take that away in a second. After they put that crown on him, they brought him back to the public, which he never should have went elsewhere. They made prisoners carry their own crosses to Golgotha, where Jesus was going to be hung. He brought the cross to the hill, and that is where they would have nailed his hands and his feet. Okay, so oftentimes when you watch movies, you see Jesus like this, right? Um, but which, that's not necessarily an accurate representation of what he would have done. It would have been more like this. Because what would have happened is that his feet would have been together. And in order for him to breathe, he would have to push up on his feet to go like this to be able to breathe. And then he would go back down for relief. And then he would be suffocating. He wouldn't be able to breathe. And he had to go back up, take a deep breath, 
That's why the Romans perfected crucifixions to create pain. So every time you're on that cross, in order to experience relief to one part of your body, you had to experience pain in another. So Jesus, ultimately, the nails, this is what the nails represent. They put them in his hands, which they could have put them in his wrists as well. In Roman culture, your hand is essentially your hand up to your elbow. Um, but the hands and feet. So your hands, this is what it represents. It represents everything you've ever done. Your feet represents everywhere you've ever been, okay? So Isaiah said he was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced for everything you shouldn't have done with your hands, and he was pierced for every place that you never should have been in the first place. Jesus died for that. So the nails represent freedom in my hands. He was was pierced for our transgressions. Freedom from everything I've ever done. Jesus paid for it on the cross. Here's what's amazing. Jesus doesn't just forgive you. He not only forgives it, he forgets it. Hebrews chapter 8 says this, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. All right, let me tell you a quick story. When I was a kid, um, I'm a Michigan fan, okay? Any Michigan fans? Okay, well, that was great. That was, okay, thanks. I was a Michigan fan, and uh, I had uh, what you would call temper tantrums or anger issues as a kid, okay? And uh, after Michigan lost to Notre Dame, I went up to my room, and I broke my window by kicking it, okay? And uh, my dad was not very happy about that, as you would imagine, Um, but my dad ended up paying for the window. And uh, I'm glad he paid for the window, But how many of you know, when your parents have to pay for something that you did, they may pay for it, but they're also going to remind you of what you did. You know what I mean? Like, I'm never letting that one down. I'm never letting that story slide. And some of you, you view God the very same way. You're like, yep, I believe God forgave me. I believe I'm going to go to heaven. But there's something in God's mind that's always there. That he's always remembering my past and what I've done. And what I just want to tell some of you today is that God has not only forgiven it, but he forgets it. Problem is, some of you may believe that. That God forgives it, he forgets it, but you can't forget it. I know I did that. I know I sinned. I know I shouldn't have done that. And you're experiencing the consequences of your action and your sins. And you have sin and you have shame. What I want to encourage you with this this morning is is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says, Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from sinful deeds that we can worship the living God. He takes the stain of shame and guilt and he makes it white as snow. There are a bunch of you here who believe in Jesus, but you're still carrying guilt and shame that Jesus doesn't ask you to carry any longer. My question for you is why are you continuing to punish yourself for something that God has already forgiven and forgotten? There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Walk in freedom today. At the ninth hour, Jesus breathed his last breath. Some people would be there for days. If they felt merciful, they would take a rod. They would break the person's kneecaps so they couldn't grasp for air anymore. At 3 p.m., our Lord and Savior, a man who had only healed, a man who had only loved, a man who came from heaven to earth, died for us. In order to make sure, the Roman guard jabbed the heart of Jesus. The Bible says that out of his chest cavity came a mixture of blood and water. Marcos, I'm going to ask you to come up here and play behind us for a moment. When I think about this story and I think about what Jesus has done for us, this is the part that gets me as I've been studying and preparing to be able to share with you this morning. Medical science says that that since the blood and water came out of his chest cavity, it would have shown that his heart had already been ruptured before they even jabbed him. So the question is, how did Jesus die? Did he die from pain? No. Did he die from blood loss? 
No. Did he die from suffocation? No. Jesus died of a broken heart. Some of you are walking into church today and your heart's broken. Isaiah said he was crushed for you. Proverbs 27 or Proverbs 17 says a merry heart is like good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up your bones. Some of you are heartbroken over a divorce, over difficulty in your marriage, a job loss, bankruptcy, a death of a loved one, a child who doesn't love God anymore. Maybe you walk in today and you feel like a disappointment. Jesus knew you would go through that and he experienced it for you. The spear that was jabbed in Jesus' heart represents freedom in my heart. That he was crushed for our iniquities. That Jesus died for us so that we could experience life in him. That Jesus was crushed so that we could experience healing in our body. He was crushed so that we could have peace in our mind. He was crushed so that we could be guilt-free with our hands and our feet. And he was crushed so that he could give you your joy back. Psalm 147 verse 3 says he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Jesus gave everything up for you and Jesus wants to bring us here today to put us back together. Some of you, you've never given your life to Jesus. And I truly believe the reason you are here this morning is because God wants you to give your life to him. If you want to give your life to Jesus, it's as simple as saying that you don't want to do it your own way. You recognize what Jesus has done for you on the cross and that you want to follow him. Others of you, you're a follower of Jesus, but you need to experience freedom this morning. And I want us all to experience the freedom that Jesus provides. When you walked in, you should have received a communion packet. I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and take this out. If you didn't receive a communion packet, go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, our team will come by and they will grab you one. Um, So raise your hand high. Our team will come grab it. As you get that communion packet, um, it's a little tricky. Go ahead and do the top first so that you can get the wafer. Remember, Jesus died on a Friday. He rose on a Sunday. On Thursday, they did Passover. Passover represents ultimately um, the communion. And Jesus took communion at the first Passover. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. This, this bread that we're about to take, it represents Jesus' body that was broken for us so that we could be healed, so that we could be made whole. So as we take this wafer, I just want to be, encourage you to remind yourself of what Jesus did for you on the cross this morning. Can we take this together? As you do that, go ahead and open up the juice. This juice represents the blood, that the blood has power, is that God's blood, Jesus' blood covers our sin, but it also has the ability to give us freedom today. Let's go ahead and take this blood or take this juice together. The purpose of communion is not only to remember what Jesus did for us, but it is a cause for celebration because of what Jesus did for us. So can we just go ahead and take a moment to thank God for what he did through his son, Jesus. The Bible doesn't instruct how often you're supposed to receive communion, but ultimately it is a remembrance of what he's done in our life. As we wrap up this morning, I want to create a moment for each of you because I don't know exactly what you're going through, but here's what I do know, that all four of those areas, I'm sure there's one area in your life where you need freedom today. I believe there's one area where God wants to move in your life today, whether it is your body, your mind, your guilt, or your heart. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet. We want to create a moment for you this morning. And I'm going to take a moment to pray for you. If you're comfortable, I'd encourage you to either lift your hands up high like this, lift your hands up like this as a posture of receiving this prayer over your life. Because I believe that God wants to do some things in your heart right now. 
So would you go ahead and just lift out your hands either here or up like this? And I wanna pray specifically for some of you today. There's gonna be four different prayers that I'm gonna pray for you. And as I pray, receive this, all right? For those of you who are struggling with something physically right now, ache, pain, diagnosis, I wanna pray for you. God, you are the ultimate physician. You have the ability to heal and restore at any time. Nothing is impossible for you. In Jeremiah, you say, I will restore to you your health and heal your wounds. Lord, I lift up every person in this room who's experiencing physical discomfort. We pray that you bring them physical rest. I pray for every person who has received a diagnosis they didn't expect. You are the God of miracles and nothing is impossible for you. We pray for healing, Lord. I lift up every person who's questioning what is wrong with them physically. They have people that aren't getting answers. God, I pray uh, for every person in this room who's struggling with discomfort. We believe that there's power in your name. Jesus, we believe that you can move in a second. You can take us further in a second than we could ever take in a lifetime. We pray that your healing power would be upon them. God, I want to take a moment to pray for every person in their minds specifically people who need to experience freedom with mental health. God, I pray for freedom in our minds. Jesus, you walked this earth and felt the strain of this world and the pressures of mental torment. I ask that you would come beside every person who is struggling with illness, worry, anxiety, stress, or addiction. Give them a peace that doesn't make sense. Give them a peace that surpasses all understanding. Help us break free from negative thought patterns and give us clarity of mind. Fill our thoughts with hope and joy joy and gratitude. Help us let go of any thoughts that are holding us back from the life you have for us. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. God, I want to lift up every person who's struggling with guilt or shame this morning. I pray for every person who's living through their rear view mirror instead of being focused on what God has for them today. God, help them know they are forgiven, that their sin and shame is washed as white as snow. Help us be people who walk in freedom that your grace and forgiveness can only provide. Help us stop punishing ourselves for our past when you've already been punished for our past. Help us let us go of shame that we've been carrying for far too long. And lastly, God, I wanna pray for joy. Some people in this room, they need their joy back, Lord. I lift up every person who has a broken heart. In Psalms, you say that you draw close to the brokenhearted. You save those whose spirits are crushed. There are many people who are walking in today weighed down by the challenges and the difficulties of life. They long to experience joy and happiness and contentment, but they feel it's out of reach. Help every person find the true joy that only comes from you and your presence and your love in our life. God, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Help us be filled with your Holy Spirit and experience an abundance of joy in our life. In the midst of our trials, struggles, and challenges, let us see them as opportunities of great joy because it is a chance to know you more. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We trust in your power to bring healing and restoration in our lives. Our faith is in you. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Jess. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We're so glad to have you. And hey, if you made a first time decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. It is the best decision that you will ever make. I want to encourage you to go to our website, purposearizona.com slash connect card, and you'll see a connect card on the website. Go ahead and fill that out. It gives us a little bit of information about you and helps us come alongside you and support you as you start this journey. Also, if you just wanna connect with our church or if you wanna invest financially in what God is doing here in the Valley, all of the information is on the website, purposearizona.com. And lastly, we meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. at Desert Edge High School, and we'd love for you to join us. Be sure to follow us on social media for any other updates. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.